in this section, we'll look at how Wilson's domestic policies, Wilson's reform progressivism, began to change as his first ter term wound down. This uh, section will really focus on about 1916, the election of 1916 included. As time passed, Wilson began to realize that he couldn't break up all large businesses as monopolies in spite of the, anti the Clayton Antitrust Act. You needed big business. Big business could only only big business could build a railroad from St. Louis to Chicago. Mom and pop businesses couldn't do it. In the modern industrial age, you need big business. So as time went along, Wilson began to adopt more of Roosevelt's regulatory approach, more of a, a new nationalism approach, which implied a, a larger regulatory federal establishment. Teddy Roosevelt had established a Department of Commerce and Labor as a new regulatory agency, but Wilson went a step further by creating the Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC, a strengthened Bureau of Corporations which had uh, existed even before Teddy Roosevelt's new department. The FTC had the power to investigate violator, violations of federal regulations. They could require regular reports from corporations and it could issue cease and desist orders, subject to just review of course, when it found unfair methods of competition. Initially, Wilson's appointees to the FTC were people with big business connections, and thus the agency wasn't as active as it might have been. In time, however, its, its membership changed and the FD, FTC became a pretty vigilant watchdog of large corporations. As Wilson's 1916 re-election approached, Wilson got through Congress several regulations. The Keating-Owen Act of 1916 barred from interstate commerce products manufactured by child labor. The legislation was significant, but had trouble in the Supreme Court, which declared it unconstitutional in 1918. Wilson also got through the Adamson Act of 1916, which established an eight-hour workday for interstate railroad workers. It should be noted here that these regulatory laws applied only to interstate commerce, commerce and business that cross state lines. According to the Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution, the federal government could only regulate businesses that cross state lines. Within one state, only the state government could regulate it. As a result, the child labor law applied only to products produced across state lines. Almost all the railroads were regarded as interstate by the extension of their lines. Wilson did get through some legislation that Teddy Roosevelt had hoped to accomplish. For one, Wilson got the Workmen's Compensation Act of 1916 passed, which was important. It provided accident and injury protection for federal workers. To help farmers, Wilson got the Federal Farm Loan Act of 1916 and the Federal Warehouse Act of 1916 passed, which taken together enabled farmers using land or crops as security to get low interest federal loans. The loans, the law rather kind of harkened back to an idea first proposed by the populists in the OMAL platform. Wilson also got in 1916 the Federal Highway Act through Congress. Uh, this provided matching funds for state highway programs. The result was a tremendous explosion in the number of federally supported highways. It was in a way a sort of a reaction to the new automobile, automobile industry and a boom to the same industry. More roads, of course, meant more, more use of cars, and it sort of helped to st set the stage for America's car culture. For his part, Wilson was an automobile enthusiast. He took almost daily rides. Wilson certainly did something that Roosevelt would have admired by signing legislation in 1916 to create the National Park Service. In essence, kind of uniting all the national parks that Teddy Roosevelt had helped create into one um, management system. The Supreme Court, as mentioned, had the power of judicial review and didn't always, you know, act fondly on progressive reforms. Most of the justices were strict constructionists, conservatives appointed by the Republican presidents in the late 19th century. A new legal theory was growing, however, that, that you know, that argued that judges should consider real-world evidence in their decisions. The uh, Constitution was a living document, and it, it was necessary to consider its provisions in the context of economic or medical or epidemiological evidence. A leading proponent of this new legal realism was Boston attorney Louis Brandeis. In 1916, Wilson nominated Brandeis to the Supreme Court. 
the first Jewish American on the high court. Disapproving of Brandeis's innovative approach to the law, the conservative American Bar Association protested, as did the New York Times, the president of Harvard, and Republican leaders in con Congress. Of course, anti-Semites opposed Brandeis because he was a Jew. But Wilson admirably stood by his nominee, and after a fierce battle, the Senate confirmed him. In the 1916 election, Wilson easily won the Democratic nomination, while the Republicans turned to Charles Evans Hughes, a Supreme Court justice and a former New York governor. But now the Republicans were more united. The insurgent La Follette wing, sort of leaving, uh, or at least weakened, by the, the old guard laissez-faire Republicans. The election was extremely close, and the war really loomed largest as an issue. As we will note later in the World War I lecture, Europeans, the European war had broken out in 1914, and the debate of whether America should get involved was really raging during the, the 1916 election year. It sort of uh, overshadowed the, more the domestic progressive issues. With his, with his supporters arguing that, he, that Wilson kept us out of the war, Wilson won the popular vote, but the Electoral College outcome remained in doubt for several weeks as the Californian tally seesawed back and forth. Ultimately, Wilson carried the state by fewer than 4,000 voters, and with it, the election. This concludes the, uh, the section on Wilson's changing progressivism uh, late in his first term.